Failure to realize your potential. It's a very typical thing that follows all aspects, both of professional sports and life itself. Whether it be unfortunate circumstances or lack of motivation, sometimes we fail to reach that greatness that we know are capable of. But what if we apply this concept to the Overwatch League? What players had crazy expectations before joining the league just to never deliver consistently, or at all for that matter? That is the question I will be attempting to answer today. To be considered a disappointment in my eyes at least, a player either has to have found major success before joining the league or were considered to be an upcoming prodigy. It doesn't count if somebody, let's say, disappointed in their first year, then moved somewhere else and played a lot better. They have to be someone who either had lots of ups and downs or no real career to begin with. If all that sounds good, let's get started. Here's my top 10 Overwatch League bust slash players who failed to live up to the hype. At number 10, I'm rolling with Beast, also known as Beast Halo. Before 2019, Beast was considered to be a top tank prospect thanks to his incredible success on Fusion University in North American contenders. Throughout 2018, they accumulated four first place finishes and were one of the greatest contender teams ever at this point. And throughout this time, Beast made some big splashes on Winston and was largely considered to be a future shining star in the making. He was supposed to be that tank player of the future who could help build a winning culture somewhere. What we got instead, though, was nothing short of a letdown. Initially, Beast was set to join the league in 2019. If I remember correctly, him and I think it was Silk Thread were supposed to be a part of the Chengdu Hunters, believe it or not. But between having to speak a different language and the really stressful environment in general, Beast ended up dropping out before anything ever really became official. And it would seem that this really would shake up his confidence for the rest of his career as he would never quite look the same after this. Regardless though, the Toronto Defiant were still willing to give him a shot as their starting main tank player in 2019. 20, especially because, again, he looked so good on Fusion University back in the day. But after some initial early trial and error, more and more problems seemed to come to the surface. He just wasn't that same guy anymore. He was struggling to be the leader that this team desperately needed. What resulted were some pretty pedestrian numbers, followed by his inevitable benching for Numlocked. The team needed a better shot caller and leader, and considering that Numlocked was nothing special himself, it's clear that Beast was not legal ready at this point in time, and after 2020 ended, that was pretty much the end of his playing days. And that's really sad, as Beast Halo was a household name in the Western scene and just an absolute legend of North American contenders. To see his potential get squandered away like this is a pretty big bummer. Maybe things could have been different under other circumstances. Number 9. OG. Okay, OG isn't a prominent bust who practically found zero success or anything. The bust aspect of OG comes through his inability to find a permanent home or consistently stay in the starting lineup. We all know what OG could do at his peak potential. He played some insanely good Overwatch for the Dallas Fuel from, I'd say, Stage 4 2018 until the end of Stage 2 2019. When he was feeling it, he was a star player that you could really put all of your trust into, and for a while, Dallas seemed like they finally had their tank of the future after all of their initial struggles in early 2018. But things started to unravel at the seam very quickly when he started suffering from burnout and just generally being a lackluster Orisa player. Dallas fell apart without him in the second half of 2019, as he was nowhere to be found a lot of the time, accompanied by mediocre play when he was around, and that was kind of the thing that signaled the end. Because for the rest of his career, there would just be constant ups and downs that left you wanting more. After 2019, Dallas chose to trade him to the LA Gladiators for Decay, where again, we'd see a lot of the same. He'd be in and out of the lineup at times, with mostly average play accompanying it. Even with a good team around him, he just felt weak and really not all that desirable as a starting main tank player. So he ends up being a failure in the Glads, and he's out of there after one season, where he then would have the cycle be repeated all over again in 2021. In a last-ditch effort, he joined a decent Florida Mayhem core, and he did have a few really solid ups in the early season. But right when it seemed like he was turning a corner, and he was finally that same guy again, more struggles and burnout came him and Florida's way. And much like what happened in Dallas, his team really suffered without his presence. His inability to handle the pressure of being a pro for a third consecutive season made it very apparent that he was just all out of chances at this point to prove himself. And just like that, OG was out of the league for good. 
Looking back at it, it's really sad more than anything else because mental health is no joke. OG seemed like he could be a borderline top 5 main tank player when he was actually feeling it. The flashes that he showed us gave us hope that he would be a superstar in this league for years to come. But instead, we got a guy who just couldn't stay on the stage and generally got worse over time. He had a job for a while, unlike a lot of other guys on this list, but the fact that he couldn't improve with so many chances gives him the label of a bust. Moving on to number 8, I'm going with My Kaylee. To put it simply, Kaylee was a decent looking hitscan prospect in the upcoming 2021 season. The Charge were looking to rebuild through some youth, and Kaylee fit the bill. He was obviously a little raw in Chinese contenders, but the talent was definitely there. All he really needed now was some professional experience and some guidance. But unfortunately for the Guangzhou Charge, coaching can only take you so far, as part of succeeding also lies on the individual. And it just so happens that Mai K. Lee did not perform well. It oftentimes felt like he was leaving his teammate Choi Se Wan on an island alone, and things never seemed to improve. I mean, he was struggling big time, and the Charge were losing map after map after map really badly with him in the lineup. And very quickly, because of this, the Charge benched him in favor of Eileen, aka a flex DPS player. Eileen's a solid player, but he's more so known as like a projectile and flex guy, so that was a big time statement. But apparently, it goes beyond just his play, as My K. Lee also lacks the maturity to handle this jump. Part of the reason he was demoted was due to immaturity and behavior issues. I could be mixing players up here, but I believe that Choi Se Wan literally told management he did not want to play alongside this guy because he was unprofessional and kind of a slacker. If your franchise player is telling you he does not want to play with somebody, that is not a very good look. And by the time we hit the summer showdown, the charge practically had zero plans for this guy in their future as they converted him into a two-way player. It couldn't be more obvious obvious that Mai K. Lee was maybe suffering from a poor environment, some teammates who maybe didn't like him that much, and just being too young to handle this promotion at the time. He needed more experience, both as a player and as a professional. It was a complete waste of time for the charge, and they weren't good as it was, you have to remember this. So this kind of stuff only makes things worse. Unsurprisingly, the charge parted ways with Mai K. Lee completely after 2021 came to a close, and he has not been back in the league since. Number 7. Let's go with Valentine. Now, an asterisk can be absolutely placed here, as Valentine only played two years on the same team, and anything could end up happening in theory if given a new opportunity elsewhere, but if we look at his career thus far, he is definitely on a trajectory to be considered a bust. Because honestly, the product that we saw on stage is not what we expected. His career pre-Owl was generally rather impressive. He started as a flex DPS on the number one team in Korean contenders at the time, aka WGS Phoenix, and his projectile play was pretty darn solid, and he was supposed to just be a major contributor heading into the Overwatch League, and a piece that Boston could potentially build their future around. But that's not what we got in two years with him. Just a whole lot of mid, really. It's not all his fault because Boston were generally mediocre, but it's not like he was some sort of consistent solution. He'd have a good showing every once in a while on like the Genji, the Reaper, or Tracer, but it would come in between numerous unmemorable performances where sometimes he'd feel completely invisible. Never an X-Factor, rarely a solution, and very replaceable. I don't mean to sound rude here, but was there ever a multi-game stretch where people were really excited about this guy outside of like the initial weeks of his career? I'd argue that most fans would agree with me and say no. He just never ever seemed to improve. It was the same deal over and over and over. Just this okay flex player who was never the worst, but nowhere near the best. When you're largely considered to be a top prospect at the damage role, you're expected to do more. Plain and simple. But what we saw is kind of embarrassing and a serious letdown for a highly sought after contenders champion. It's still very early on, but right now, he's definitely a bust. Number 6. Taimu. You all knew it was coming eventually. At least one Dallas player from the Envious core was needed for this list. I decided to pick Taimu because he was pretty well accomplished before his Overwatch League career, and then once he joined the league, he basically did nothing at all. And that's a shame because pre-Owl, he was an absolute legend. His Widowmaker, his Roadhog, winning an Apex, the man did it all, and he amassed quite the reputation throughout this process. 
So generally, on a star-studded Dallas roster, the belief heading into the inaugural season was that his stardom would continue. He'd be a superstar on a contending team. Well, not really, because Dallas got boomed in the early season, and Taimu took it really hard compared to some of his other teammates. Because after Dallas lost a few games early on in Stage 1, his confidence wavered very quickly. That godly sniper that was just absolutely out of this world could not get anything going. He was largely overshadowed by effect, and while he was making a name for himself, Taimu's playtime was decreasing. And then the whole fiasco happened when he had to play Winston for a short while, and that only further destroyed his mental. There were a lot of times where I believe he even considered quitting, as the mental battle became very hard to surmount. A legend was becoming irrelevant before our very eyes. Now thankfully, he managed to turn a corner for a bit during Stage 4 2018, when he looked like an absolute god on anything he touched. But after that 11 game stretch ended, his spotlight would forever turn off. He finally had his mental on the right track, things were going the right way for him, he looked like a star player again, and then it got taken away from him just like that when he got benched in favor of rookie player Zachary in the GOATS era. By the time Taimu got any sort of chance to prove himself again, he was so checked out and Dallas were so bad that it really did not matter in the slightest. And in spite of his best efforts, he was pretty low impact and made zero difference in helping Dallas stop a losing streak in late 2019. From an apex champion and Finnish legend to a streaky player who barely even played. If that's not a waste of potential, I don't know what is. Sorry Dallas fans, but your pain doesn't end quite yet, because at number 5, I'm rolling with, speak of the devil, Zachary. Taimu arguably had higher expectations at the Overwatch League level, but at least he had a few brief moments of delivery. The same can't really be said for Zach, you know? Coach Arrow was obsessed with him, and he believed in him in every way, shape, and form. A ridiculous amount of faith was put into this young player at the time, and he just wasn't able to deliver. We saw his potential and success firsthand on Fusion University, and we saw a taste of him in the World Cup, and it just felt like he could be a pretty decent guy at the Overwatch League level with some more training. He could be a star hit scan and like a decent contributor and like a rotation, let's say. He just needed a bit more time to develop and learn the ropes, right? Zack seemed like he could be a good starter based on his Fusion University days, but Dallas decided to gravely misuse him and overly trust him, and that's kind of where things went downhill really fast. They plugged him into the starting lineup right away, and there were times where his inexperience got totally exposed. His Brigitte was just meh. Not the worst, but a lot of problems for sure. But that's not the main issue. I think the real issue came in the second half of 2019. That's when coaching really started to screw this guy up and put his trajectory right down the toilet. Dude was a hit scan player in Contenders for crying out loud, and they thought it was a good idea to make him their flex DPS. They thought he was this versatile god who could play anything they needed, when in fact, some of this stuff was just out of his comfort zone. Arrow was putting way too much trust in him. They forced him into a more unnatural role, and he suffered greatly from it. But whenever Dallas played poorly, fans were quick to blame this poor man, which definitely affected his confidence. And after 2019 was over, the hate was at an all-time high. And sadly, the poor guy never got another chance to prove himself. He never saw the stage ever again after his rookie year, and his motivation was completely gone as he moved on to professional Valorant soon after. I feel pretty bad for him, the org really destroyed what he could have been in a very, very short amount of time, and that falls a lot on their over-trusting of this guy. More hype was put into this guy than it should have, and there was so much belief that he was supposed to be a future investment, and all they got in return if you're Dallas is one lousy year. His fault or not, his potential was never realized at all at the Overwatch League level, and it's a very sad sight to behold. Now at number 4, sorry in advance Dallas fans, this is the last one I promise, it's gonna be Coco. Coco makes the list for a slightly different reason compared to others. Yeah, he wasn't anything special, like Taimu and some of his other envious teammates, but his reason for being a bust goes way further. This guy literally got benched at every single corner. You can blame the coaching as much as you want to here, and trust me, they are absolutely to blame in this situation as well, but it gets to a point where something else has to go into it if a team is refusing to utilize you when you're the only, yes, 
only active tank player at the main tank position on the roster. You've got to be part of the problem in some way, shape, or form if Taimu and Mickey are getting playtime over you. They prefer two guys with literally zero experience professionally on Winston, as well as XQC and OG. Even as a last resort, they refused to play him, and it got to a point where Coco was barely even scrimming be it because of people complaining about him, coaching not liking what they saw, or maybe something else, Coco was barely ever present. This guy was a champion in Apex, and you're telling me that he wasn't a good enough leader or playmaker to even start at all? Dallas literally tried to trade him, and nobody wanted him. There's gotta be some sort of attitude issue in there, right? I mean, what does that tell you? There's clearly a lack of motivation and performance going on to some extent. Guy went from top of the world to retired within one season. Dallas desperately needed him, especially during the XQC drama and OG suspension, and he just wasn't there for him. Considering his past, that is a pretty bad look for a guy who we all knew could have been a lot more. Now we're entering the top three, where we really start to hit the cream of the crop. Taking up the number three spot is Flower, also known as one of the greatest one-hit wonders in Overwatch history. Flower made a name for himself worldwide with his iconic performance in the 2017 World Cup. He wasn't quite old enough to be in the Overwatch League yet, but was widely seen as an upcoming prodigy because of his insane skill and flexibility. But little did we know, 2017 is where he'd peak, because not long after, he'd spend a whole year on the NYXL's academy team, biding his time until he turned 18. But it was during this time that his stock began to plummet. He was generally unimpressive, and people started to question if he'd ever be the same. But nonetheless, New York promoted him and gave him a chance. He still did have really high potential and excellent mechanics, and could in theory be that final piece to push the NYXL to a new level. But sometimes, life just doesn't work out the way we want it to. Because as it turns out, the concerns that people had during his contenders days were very warranted, as he was nowhere near good enough to play in the GOATS era. And even when DPS finally made its return during the whole Rolock thing that happened, he rarely saw the stage. In the minds of the coaching, it seemed that he was just not a winning formula, and it's a real shame because he was an absolute god in his heyday, but sometimes these things end up happening. You're hyped up as this amazing player, but then situations change around you. You lose confidence in yourself. You wait too long to join the league. The competition around you improves. He had his time to shine, but it just wasn't sustainable because too much time had passed. Flower had the potential to be one of the greatest players in the entire world, and yet he found himself in the league for just a single year before leaving and never coming back. And one can't help but wonder what could have ended up happening if he was old enough during the inaugural season. Maybe things could have played out differently. Regardless, Flower had unreal expectations, and he could barely even get playtime on his own team. That is a major fall from grace for a once legend of the game, hence why he lands a top 3 spot in this list. Looking into number 2, I'm going with Roar. Roar is a pretty sad case, cause he actually was given a couple of great opportunities to make a career for himself. Regardless of how good you really thought he was during his pre-Owl days, he still was a part of that memorable Kongdu Panthera team and Korean contenders, and both his Winston and his Ryan did have some pretty sick moments. He was absolutely one of the most sought-after tank prospects in the 2019 season, and it says a lot that Decay probably wanted to sign somewhere alongside him. He'd come in and replace Fissure to be that next big thing on a pretty solid LA Gladiators roster. They were putting a ton of trust in him because they saw his potential. But things don't always work out like I've been saying throughout this entire video. I don't really know if it's because of communicating in English or the skills not translating to the Overwatch League level, but no amount of coaching seemed to correct his mistakes and there just wasn't any sort of improvement. He definitely did have some solid moments in his rookie year, but he was nothing to write home about. He was just okay, which isn't that great considering how much promise he had shown on an excellent team in Korean contenders. And it's clear the Gladiators thought the same because they were done with him after just one one season. They sent him on his way to the Washington Justice, as they knew something that we didn't at the time, because when he played for Washington, 
He was pretty bad. It's by no means all his fault because the Justice were awful at the time, but he definitely was more of a problem than a solution. The way he played Orisa and Ryan were, well, questionable to say the least. It's pretty easy for a tank player to look bad on a terrible team, but Roar felt different. He genuinely felt like one of the worst starters in the Overwatch League, and as it turns out, there was a very good reason for it. Supposedly, Roar did not try very hard to improve. He supposedly never even attempted to play the game in ranked or stream or anything outside of scrims. It's one thing to try your best and fail, I don't think anybody can fault you for that, but it's completely different when you just refuse to try and improve. His interest in being a player seemed to waver by the second. He was an absolute hindrance to his team. So come playoff time, he was completely gone from the starting lineup. In the moment that he ended up leaving that lineup, the team showed a lot more promise as they went on their famous lower bracket playoff run. Ideal meta or not, that is a very telling thing. And something you have to keep in mind is a lot of teams were still rolling with the Winston during the early playoffs, so the fact that the Justice wanted to play more of an anti-meta thing at the time is crazy. This team was instantly better just by putting Roar on the bench. Instead of showing progression as a young and talented player, he only got worse as time went on. So it really was not much of a surprise when his career came to a close by the 2020 offseason. Roar was supposed to be a tank player of the future, but all we got were a couple of flashes followed by a whole lot of awful and question marks about his character. So much potential down the drain just like that. And finally, at the number one spot, I have none other than Miro, and boy does this one hurt a lot. Putting a legend this high up on a list like this is awful, but compared to everybody else, I just feel like he takes the cake. Miro is one of the most legendary players in the history of professional Overwatch, as he is a major predecessor for what we see at the tank position today. He paved the way for a lot of amazing Winston players, and was generally one of the first superstars in the game's history, and he built a crazy legacy on his way to Seoul, a World Cup gold medal, two Apex Championships, and the title of one of the best tank players in the entire world. A true legend of the game, with insane skills, an amazing hero pool, everything checked out through and through. So naturally, the expectation was that he would be a force on the Soul Dynasty. He was playing alongside a lot of his former Apex teammates. The meta was Winston-centric. He was one of the best players in the entire world. He had an amazing support line to back him up. It was such an ideal environment for him to continue building his legacy. But fate sadly had other plans in store for him. Things started off fine for him and Soul as they were winning a good bit, but the moment that things started not going their way and they were labeled as chokers and the weakest Korean team, there was a lot of mental boomage going on. At every single turn, Soul were losing to their biggest rivals and missing the stage playoffs. And when you're a title favorite like this and you're being a huge letdown when it matters, somebody has to be blamed. And as it turns out, all the fingers were being pointed at Miro behind the scenes. And while some of the criticism was maybe a bit too harsh, he did not look like a true top-tier main tank player anymore. Fissure, Gesture, Mono, Fate, Gamsu, they all genuinely looked better and more comfortable out there. But in general, he just couldn't quite take over a game like he used to and was supposedly not a great in-game leader or shot caller. Miscommunication was absolutely killing Soul, and something had to be done about it. And Soul's solution in this scenario? Bench Miro. But who they benched him for is the thing that really turns some heads and makes you think of him as a bust. Kind of like with Coco, Soul went with the out of position strategy. To get better shot calling, they decided to turn to Ryu J. Hong, a player with no prior experience as a professional tank player. And the pathetic thing about it is, the team did have some competitive sets early on and they found some success for a short period of time when they swapped to J. Hong. Obviously, this J. Hong thing was a bad idea, but the moment that they did try it at first, they got a sweep against Houston, they took their first ever maps against the London Spitfire, which is something that Miro was never able to accomplish, and they even pushed a really good Valiant team five maps. The team had a better chance to win with a support player on Winston than their World Cup and Apex legend. And even after the Jaehong experiment came to a close, Kuki started to get more playtime. Miro was gone. 
the faith the team had in him was completely gone. Their season was literally on the line during Stage 4, and during the late parts of Stage 3 even. I mean, they were in danger of missing the playoffs, and yet they would still rather have him be on the bench and leave it in the hands of an inexperienced tank player like Jay Hong. And after Seoul ended up missing the playoffs, they were done with Miro for good. And it would seem that the rest of the league thought the same because Miro was never able to make it back to the league as a player. We can of course kind of at least blame some of it on internal issues and poor coaching and all of that, but the fact that no one wanted to even give him a chance after that is pretty telling. One of the most legendary and iconic players in the history of professional Overwatch lasted a single season in the league. That is failing to live up to your potential to the maximum, and just given his resume and what transpired, I'd argue that Miro is the biggest disappointment in Overwatch League history. But maybe you feel differently about this entry and some of the others on this list, which is why I'm now going to turn things over to you here at the end of this video. Who do you think the biggest bust in league history are, and why? Let me know down in the comments below. And if you enjoyed today's video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe if you want more Overwatch League content. And until next time, this is ATP, signing out. Peace.